Hello, everyone, and welcome back to day three of the Nasher Prize Graduate Symposium dedicated to the work of the 2022 Nasher Prize Laureate, Nairi Bagramian. I'm Catherine Kraft, curator at the Nasher Sculpture Center, and I'll be moderating today's proceedings. We have our two final papers today, and we'll be responding to questions at the end after the second talk. I'd like to invite and encourage all of you to please submit questions for both our speakers through the chat function. Our first speaker is Jana Labraska, University of Texas at Austin. The title of her paper is Rest, Resistance, Suspension, Nairi Bagramian's Object Lessons. Take it away, Jana. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the other panelists, um, to Dr. Kraft for the introduction, and to the Nasher um, for the invitation to speak today, and for the opportunity to um, think deeply about Mary Bagramian's work. I should begin by saying that I have not yet had the opportunity to see any of the works I will discuss today in person, and that my thought about it is shaped by both the limitations and new capacities offered by our present moment of intermittent physical isolation, relative geographic stasis, and remote digital access. I acknowledge that my argument could and likely would be different were I to speak from experiences of physical encounter with the works I will discuss today. These ideas are open to revision. In what follows, I intend to mount an experiment using a few of Bagramian's works and interpretive methods informed by transgender studies, which promise critics and historians new ways of accounting for multiple, mutable, successive, and non-binary gender modalities in art and its history. This methodological orientation, as David Getze and Che Gossett argue in their recently published Syllabus for Transgender and Non-Binary Methods in Art History, illuminates not only the study of transgender subjects, but also offers descriptive and analytic modes for accounting for and nourishing the complexities and multiplicities of non-ascribed genders in conjunction with a critique of the systemic suppression and erasure of them. My experiment today is to approach Bagramian's work through a transgender studies lens with the goal of better understanding the potential of objects to train us for a kind of seeing that suspends deflects, and otherwise productively challenges our ingrained habits of perception. I am arguing that to see this quality in Bagramian's work is to exercise our ability to extend such courtesy and reflective pause, not only to objects, but to bodies as well. As I wrote my proposal for this talk last fall, I attended a symposium called Rethinking German Minimalism at the Dia Foundation in Chelsea, in which the artist and writer Gordon Hall engaged a gender nonconforming analytic in a discussion of Amy Knobel's 250,000 drawings. The talk was called On Closed Boxes, and in it, Hall described being both curious about and comfortable not knowing for sure whether the lacquered exteriors of Knobel's locked black monolithic cabinets do in fact contain the thousands of drawings suggested by the work's title. Believing, Hall argues, in the unverifiable fullness of Knobel's cabinets is an exercise in vision that, quote, flexes a capacity that is so vital to trans and gender nonconforming life, not just believing what people say about what is inside them, but allowing, even encouraging, that knowledge to shape our vision, our read of a body. Although mutually inflecting registers of belief and perception have fostered troubling developments in the spread of myths and disinformation in the public sphere, Hall argues that it is nevertheless vital to maintain and expand our ability or capacity to see, trust, and believe bodies as valid and human according to their own logics, no matter how much they disrupt normative expectations. In the talk, Hall referred to this potential as the capacity of formally reduced sculpture to offer a resource for those of us looking to refuse. Legibility, respectability, cliched symbolism, representation, gatekeeping, surveillance, needing to make ourselves make sense according to presently existing logics, 
even when those logics do not fully enable our lives. At the same time, Hall pointed out, shared perceptual belief shapes communities, which creates boundaries that then must also be guarded and maintained. While openness and accessibility are important values for public institutions, some kinds of subcultural spaces need their boundaries. As Hall puts it, these boundaries exclude, but also protect. These kinds of spaces, community spaces, marginalized spaces, need to remain mostly closed. Because communities are, communities are destroyed by the presence of too many people who can't see because they don't believe. Elsewhere in published writing, interviews, and in relation to his studio practice, Hall describes a methodology for thinking about sculpture as a wellspring for object lessons. He proposes that while three-dimensional artworks can teach us about their origins, makers, and contexts, they can also offer up their own embodied pedagogies. Less concerned with sculpture's symbolic or semantic dimensions than with how phenomenological encounters with them might alter our sense of being, objects give us tools to, quote, develop, recognize, respect, and cultivate different forms of gendered living. It is this framework of the object lesson and its exhilarating potential for articulating radical pedagogies of relation that structures my exploration of Bagramian's contributions to the living history of sculpture and installation today. I build this talk, I built this talk out of what I see as vital object lessons in Bagramian's work, which I am articulating through three related thematics, rest, resistance, and suspension. Implicit in the object lesson is the discursive space between sculpture and object already built into the art historical lineage in which Bagramian's work has been contextualized. A story that usually includes minimalism, post-minimalism, site specificity, and institutional critique. In US debates on three-dimensional art beginning in the 1960s, the terminological slippage between sculpture and object was a source of much more friction than it is today. These debates turned on language charged with gender and sexual politics in ways that fall outside the scope of this discussion, but are worth noting in brief. For critics of the 19... For critics of the 1960s and on, the argument about art versus objecthood hinged on a system of aesthetic value that privileged an object's autonomy, its disinterestedness, its ability to stand free of its context. For many artists of the period, the mobilization of object as a term for art became a way of talking about a transition away from sculpture as it had been historically understood to something less transparently, transparently understandable according to the existing terms of art. The specific object, installation, sculpture in an expanded and expanding field, Objects as distinct from but related to sculptures make requests of us about how they want to be viewed socially, just like people do. In turn, our relationships with objects inform our habitual actions. An object's solicitation of a viewer's involvement with it is precisely what gives it its power to teach us how to see. Therefore, I am distancing myself here somewhat from the category of sculpture as such, um, conceiving of the object in the object lesson in the sense that Donald Judd theorized it in his 1964 essay, Specific Objects. And this, of course, is um, unabashedly informed by my own years of learning and experience with the work of that particular artist. That is, I am interested in the valence of object that makes use of all the productive ambiguity born of the double negative. It is not painting, but not sculpture. It is not a particular form and not the space it inhabits not a body, but not, not a body. It is something elusive and beyond these boundaries, which in its mode of address can, and direct address can help us to perceive without having to make a judgment about all the space, time, and variation, even within the most rigidly defined parameters. If we choose to receive this object lesson from so-called minimal work, we come to realize that there is far more possibility between, within, 
and around the articulated shapes, positions, and identifications than we might have previously thought. And it is in this tension between such objects and the viewing body, between the categories designated by language and legibility, that the real teaching takes place. Judd vehemently disagreed with the term minimalism for this reason. He didn't see the work as reductive or minimal at all. Like Hall, Judd looked at the boxes and saw them as full. With the specific ambiguity of the object established, I want to introduce the first object lesson I am positing in Bagramian's work, a lesson on rest. Of the many definitions of rest, I mean to invoke it not as sleep or death, but as a temporary liberation from the demands of work or activity, the brief sonic void in a piece of music when a singer or musician playing a wind instrument might take a breath, what remains left over when all else has been claimed, the rest. Regarding her 2020 sculpture commissioned by the Clark Art Institute, Knee and Elbow, Bagramian has said that the piece concerns the question of how the burden associated with the pose could be resolved. Who poses and how are poses burdened? I'm so sorry, can you hear this uh, work going on? I'm just gonna keep reading. A body typically assumes a pose, a particular position of stilled movement to meet the gaze of another, to be represented as an image. To pose is to arrange oneself in ways that inevitably reference or subvert, as the case may be, socially constructed and enforced categories of gender and sexuality. In an essay titled Posing, Craig Owen suggests that the pose is more realistically imposed on the subject in a social matrix. Sexuality comes not from within, but without, imposed on the child from the world of adults. Assuming a pose is a way of making oneself seen, a process of briefly casting oneself in the form of an object in order to gain legible subjecthood. To take a pose, Bagramian says, in itself a temporary state, which implies successive moments of release. These intermittent pauses, writes Dr. Miwon Kwan, correspond to the recuperative state before and after the poses, the respite that allows for the upholding of temporary poses. Evoking the major load-bearing joints of the limbs, which are often, but not always, possessed by bodies of all genders, Knee and elbow does not simulate, but demonstrates rest. It models being at home in one's surroundings in stable yet active repose. Actually, knee and elbow being both two and one courts the pronouns they and them. They are complete as themselves, textured marble bodies consisting of multiple materials and supports. They are both monumental and filled with the potential energy of the genderqueer giant to whom such limbs might belong. Knee and elbow's rest seems charged with the option to change, reflect, renegotiate, a reminder that each moment of rest is an opportunity to approach our pose, our attitudes, gestures, and presentation with fresh intention. Indeed, rest is a matter of survival for marginalized people and activists involved in the ongoing struggle for collective liberation. Ideas of pleasure activism and radical rest carve out spaces of healing justice for those seeking to build a world that is safe for all of us. To civil rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer's intersectional declaration that nobody's free until everybody's free, we might add on the infinitive to rest. Respecting the inherent value of stillness, retreat, and repair brushes against the grain of capitalist heteropatriarchal systems of oppression that demand constant doing. For those of us with the privilege to find it, rest fosters conditions for self-reflection, consideration, and calm dialogue until the next match of raised voices. Defined in this way, rest is both distinct from and continuous with resistance, the second object lesson I wish to discuss. Um, by resistance, I do not mean to refer to armed violence, but a subtler refusal to comply. 
the impeding, slowing, or stopping effect exerted by one material thing on another. When I look at a work such as Spanner of 2008, I see an object resisting collapse in direct proportion to the degree that it is materially and gravitationally possible. I see a relatively small thing applying pressure to the boundaries of a room far larger than itself. Spanner, like many of Bagramian's works, derives its ability to hold itself up from the combined resistance of different apparatus, like a body whose shape can affirm its inhabitants' vision of themselves by the addition, modification, or subtraction of parts, both soft and rigid. Spanner models a heterogeneously non-normative structural integrity. Spanner resists like a, a line drawn in waxy crayon under a wash of watercolor not with overt aggression, but with quiet stability. A work such as Bouncer, um, in a, a work such as Bar Bouncer marks a threshold in the exhibition venue, um, marking the easy to overlook weight, tension, and structural energy of the architectural passage from one room to another. To prop up and fit sheets of aluminum in existing doorways is to render the structural vocabulary of architecture somewhat abstract, while simultaneously insisting on its fundamental tether to the material parameters of hardness, tensile strength, and texture. To activate the resistance or drag of the bowing sheet metal on a rectilinear threshold is to make a different shape within and out of the existing shape, finding a kind of formal abstraction in, architectural, or in architecture's functional syntax. The work's title evokes both voluptuous springiness and the job of deciding who gets into the club or the VIP lounge. This curvaceous bouncer admits any body who decides to pass beneath it. Itself a passage without trying to pass, bouncer resists the hegemonic taxonomies of architecture and sculpture inside and outside here and there, male and female, process and product. In his essay, Unbuilding Gender, Trans and Architectures in and Beyond the Work of Gordon Matta Clark, Jack Halberstam asks, what might the abstract and architectural offer in terms of transgender representation? Borrowing the term and architecture, a portmanteau of anarchy and architecture theorized in the 1970s by artists associated with the and architecture group. Halberstam claims that the modes of creative destruction Matta Clark employed in works like Splitting or Day's End can be understood to allegorize the building and unbuilding of gender variant embodiments. Surgically slicing into decaying micro monuments of suburban domesticity and industrialism, Matta Clark's and architectural cuttings have been read as a macrocosm for the human body. Halberstam argues that Matta Clark's sculptural interventions on buildings productively rupture traditional bifurcations of the self into mind and body, as well as male and female. With her works that suspend themselves in and creep around thresholds, Bagramian likewise mounts a critique of the formal project of architecture itself, while offering multiple escape routes from the systems that claim bodies and spaces. Rather than conceiving transgender embodiment as a mere switching between one origin, the wrong body, and one destination, the right body, Halberstam writes that trans embodiment is, quote, not to claim rightness, but to, to dismantle the system that meets out rightness and wrongness according to the dictates of various social orders. Gender transition is often a process of rebuilding the body, modifying this, extending that, smoothing one area, enlarging another, taken in an improvised order and personal order based on the resources available. He writes, the framework of a journey has become misleading. It proposes a destination to which many transgender people are indifferent. In an enormous paradigm shift, we have begun to think less about definitive transition and more about a continuous building and unbuilding of the body. What was previously theorized as a stubborn pursuit of a seemingly impossible goal now appears as a project of dismantling and remaking 
a sculpting of flesh and molecular form using the tools of surgery and hormones for sure, but also deploying the concept of transgender as a kind of wrecking ball that can knock and batter at the fortress of binary gender. De-emphasizing the evocation of medical interventions on the gendered body, this framing of trans embodiment understands an architecture as a strategy that, quote, resists mastery, refuses to build, and finds other ways to alter the environments we move through. At the modest scale of a doorway, Bagramian's bouncer offers an understated and experientially immediate iteration of the strategy behind Mata Clark's and architectural cuts and holes, which mark the thresholds of the rooms we inhabit as portals to unbuilt futures. The form of frictional resistance I have been talking about is also, oh, I keep spoiling my slides. Um, is also a kind of suspension, which is the third, but by no means the last, object lesson that I see in Bagramian's work. I do not mean suspension in the sense of being debarred from one's position or the suspension of services or subscriptions when you haven't paid your bill. Rather, I am more interested in the suspension of disbelief, of providing the support on which something is held the condition of being suspended as particles in a medium or the state of being dispersed in fluid. As a not irrelevant aside, the Oxford English Dictionary includes a rare obsolete use of the word to mean an ecstasy of contemplation in reference to the way St. Teresa is held in thrall by Bernini's androgynous angel who penetrates her with a golden spear as she leans back, awash in eroticized spiritual elation. To illustrate this sense of suspension, um, I will close with a brief discussion of Bagramian's series Side Leaps and her presentation of this body of work in the context of a collaboration with her sister in creation, Jeanette Laverriere, in the 2019 exhibition Work Desk for an Ambassador's Wife that has been spoken of elsewhere in this symposium. An ongoing and undated series beginning in 1999, Bagramian's side leaps are an expanding group of maquettes and drawings for sculptures not intended to be realized. Bagramian displays these works in partially open and otherwise non-traditional vitrines of galvanized steel and plexiglass of her own design, emphasizing their intentionally ambiguous relation to the viewer's space and time. The title of the series refers to a movement in ballet in which the dancer moves from one foot to another, while the German translation of the phrase can refer to a secret relationship or affair. Both associations inform Bagramian's conception of the side leaps as, quote, strands of production on the periphery, which relate to her primary body of work in a horizontal rather than hierarchical fashion as a, quote, circumnavigation and distancing of the foreseeable and the necessary, these works are happily dislocated. They display, as the artist put it, no space and no horizon as a sign of temporary utopia. She's, oh. She sees her interest in drawing as a hinge between ideas and sculptural materiality in relation to the condition of large scale works that are destroyed or unrealized due to oppressive political circumstances. Artist visionary structures suppressed under fascism or Stalinism are one such example, while the work of Jeanette Laverriere, a female practitioner in the male dominated field of modernist design is another. A Swiss-born designer and artist who, according to the exhibition's press release, conceived of her own mind as an interior architectural space, Laverriere moved during her long career from producing functional objects, such as the Chapeau Chinoise lamp in the upper corner, um, and the 1940s design for which the exhibition is named, the work desk, um, with concealed drawers for love letters sent to an imagined dignitary spouse, um, and then Laverriere began producing, towards the end of her career, intentionally useless objects, which, in her own words, opened, a new, opened up a new world for her. Throughout a life that spanned over a century, Laverriere produced a voluminous quantity of drawings and ideas for objects that were never put into production. 
But Gramian has shared public exhibition platforms with Le Verrier since 2008, when they collaborated on the piece uh, with, whose title translates to The Lamp in the Grandfather Clock, which was first presented at the Berlin Biennial of that year. The work, which pictured here, was shown again at, um, at Marion Goodman, is a plexiglass construction modeled on the layout of Le Verrier's Paris apartment that functions as an armature for several of her creations, such as her Bibliothèque Tournante and mirror sculptures from her Evocation series, which began in 1936. Although it consists of discrete works, this exhibition could equally be understood as a Gajamkunstwerk or total work of art. Bagramian suspends each object in an overall matrix of possibility for revision, for collaboration, for continuity. Finished works, works in formation, and those in formation as a state of, as a state of finish cohabitate and they look good doing it. But Gramian brings along her friend, Le Verrier, who passed away in 2008, showing us more than one way that un- or under-realized work of previous generations can live on through care and collaborative dialogue. An object lesson in Bagramian's strategy of display, then, echoes her philosophy of the pose, that states of being are temporary and that the inter interstices between them are filled with potential. Bagramian demonstrates that in making things and in making ourselves as gendered subjects, we have the chance to imagine and reimagine how to see and be seen. In the essay about the artist on the Nasher's website, the author writes of side leaps, quote, encased in plexiglass vitrines, Bagramian's unrealized projects masquerade as finished works, as if hoping to pass as functional sculptures. Respectfully, I disagree. I see them hardly hoping to pass, and it is in not passing that they do their most profound pedagogical work. Resolutely unfinished, unbuilt, speculative, quote, an encyclopedia that aims for incompletion. Side leaps solicit a type of viewing that temporarily suspends our intellectual routines of definitive categorization. A gender nonconforming ethic, as I suggested earlier, aims to protect and stand with those of us who feel most at home in suspension between the binary poles of man and woman. Like their heterogeneous textures, like gender, the side leaps are palpable not in stasis, but in their becoming. With curiosity, experimentality, and humor, the Gramian's objects teach that there is far more to discover between the way stations on the spectra of embodiment and objecthood than there are named positions. Thank you. Thank you, Jana, for that um, really compelling paper. Um, to those watching, I go ahead and remind you once again to please submit questions for Jana and the chat will be uh, returning to those after our next presentation, um, our second and final speaker is Frederick Cruz Noel from Cornell University. And he will be speaking on Mari Bagramian's Misfits Against a Higher Harmony. Frederick? Thank you very much. My presentation today was inspired by this quote from the artist. Within the framework of educational objectives and the reading of sculptural forms, the handling of the dysfunctional should be appreciated and the moment of the supposed final comprehension should be given space. Space. The moment of the supposed final comprehension should not be determined as a transitional state in favor of harmony and the functional. Today, I want to think a little bit more about an alternative sense of harmony more than social conformity as it may be understood in relation to Neri Bagramian's misfits. I know it's been discussed in some papers earlier this week, so I'm just going to touch upon it. But for now, Bagramian's site responsive practice foregrounds the historical contingency of an art object, which the artist attests 
despite its considerable autonomy, is always linked to time, place, and socio-political context in which it appears. In her decades of commitment to this approach, a refreshing lack of philosophical idealism, in my perspective, Bagramian has managed to interject her sculptural and formal thinking into the logic of exhibition contexts that clandestinely operate to universalize ethical demands. The projects that first come to mind that are not misfits in this context are Class Reunion Here and Retainer, which embrace the opportunity to exploit the humor out of an asymmetrical dynamic. These membranes manage to find the possibility of difference by not being absorbed in the gravitational pull of discursive acts of alterity, which can often clandestinely operate under the guise of urgent causes like radical transformation or blurring boundaries in contemporary art exhibition contexts specifically. Bagramian's intelligent and sometimes inexplicable humor can also be a dastardly weapon in situations that specifically overlook specificity and the concreteness of human conditioning in history. The site response appealing of the children's garden in Gam Milan is what drew me to this very recent Misfits exhibition. And I have not seen this exhibition in 2021, but I have seen many of her other works. So the slides I've arranged here are a creative reimagining based on my past experiences. This project began with the specific urban setting of, in Milan, which had once been an English garden open to adults only when accompanied by children. Edging into this unusual circumstance of the exhibition space, Bagramian utilized windows that reveal a garden, which is reserved exclusively for children and the adults who accompany them. Each work on display comprises two parts that are made of different materials, painted cassette aluminum and wood for the interior pieces and marble for the exterior ones. In the coinciding exhibition of Misfits at the Marion Goodman Gallery in Paris, the sculptures are still one aluminum and then one is wood from Yonvo's McNamara project. Since other presentations have looked at this, I want to make sure that I focus on one aspect in particular, which is the appearance of the toy and a hopefully artist approved text for the gallery. Bagrabian states that by combining the idea of play as an educational tool with reflection on the experience of disappointment and inadequacy, the artist created a series of large-scale sculptures formerly designed to inhabit both the interior and exterior spaces of the museum. Thinking of play as a process or an educational tool has a historical pedagogical past in the mid 19th century. And that's what my paper will address also in relationship to the concept of harmony. But before I think about that, I want to look at this a little bit more. In an art forum article that I was finding just to scope the recent uh, writings about this, Excuse me. I found a I found one negative review, a sort of negative review, but it poked it provoked me to think about my initial interrogation further. In the short write up, and I don't mean to critique further, is uh, the author says her message of nonconformity could feel a little heavy handed and dated, especially for anyone aware of widely lauded alternative educational approaches, such as the Montessori or Reggio Emilia methods, both of which originated in Italy. And I want to remind uh, you that this particular understanding of harmony, which proposes nonconformity as the opposite of harmony, reflects a distinctly neoliberal vision of harmonic concordance as a kind of social assimilation. 
This is the kind of relational aesthetics that cultivates a space of unity, cohesion, and wholeness. For the interpretive goals of some writers, that kind of harmony is ethically desirable. For some others, like this one, the merits of this anti-assimilationist poetic was not necessarily invigorating. My goal today is not to take either side on this, not because I'm ethically apathetic, but in theory, questioning nonconformity as a desirable moral stance seems reasonable, as does advocating in favor of it. I wanted to bring this very clear conception of social harmony to the foreground in the conceptual framing of misfits because it helps elucidate the ethical utility of a different kind of harmony that is part of the historically contingent conceptual framework of this exhibition. In the early 20th century, amidst a second wave boom of progressive education reforms in Europe and the United States, which included the methods of Maria Montessori and others, harmony and social harmony were not necessarily in direct binary opposition to nonconformity. Rather, and often explicitly, values like eternal unity and the sacredness of the child's individuality not only existed simultaneously but also worked to mutually reinforce the vitality of a different kind of harmony that necessitated a primal polarity of all, all beings in the universe. This harmony is a tradition of musical speculation, sometimes called cosmic harmony or the music of the spheres. For a host of prolific reformers in the 19th and 20th century who were thinking of radical education reform efforts and who also shared deep ties to theosophical strands of mysticism or occultism, including Friedrich Froebel, Johann Heinrich Pestalozzi, Rudolf Steiner, Maria Montessori, and a consecutive string of Bauhaus masters, including Johannes Itten, Gertrude Gruno, Lothar Schreyer, and Laszlo Moholy-Nagy, and especially Kandinsky, this music theoretical concept was variously employed as an underlying and vital principle of their pedagogical philosophy. As the root of this metaphysical and mystical reform activity, the so-called inventor of the kindergarten is pictured here. The toys reference vaguely in the assembly building part objects come from this tradition of trying to realize the harmony of the spheres. His natural method of educating the child in, quote, the order of the mind's growth had great currency in the context of 19th century intellectual trends in Germany towards organicism, as did his topical pedagogical ethics in a Rousseauian era of placing intuitive sensing above, quote, rational knowledge or books. The contemporary, as in then, and lasting, as in now, and at the turn of the 20th century, influence of Froebel's kindergarten philosophy and system is in large part attributed to his ability to practically consolidate his mystical philosophy of nature, shared by many, for a wide range of audiences and applications. The educational objective he persistently kept in view was not mere knowledge, but free self-active development from within. And this mantra of learning by doing not only informed the pragmatist politics of the United States at the turn of the century, but still remains at the core of many progressive educational practices today. However, Froebel's pedagogy was a mystical and cosmic pedagogy. And if you attend to the limitations of universalist perspectives towards geometric abstraction, one might not necessarily realize that there is some proto-New Age um, alchemy in, in the mix. This institution was built upon one universal law, 
to which he related all educational processes by which he tested all educational methods and on which he founded all educational principles. Froebel believed that God created all things in a universal, interdependent, and inter-influencing, ever-progressive harmony of universal interconnection, which was the coordinating element of all life. In this context, it is not the context of which uh, platonic, neoplatonic harmony can be traced back. In this environment, they believed that the ancient Greeks were, thought that the cosmos had an order to it, but that this order is musical, expressed as harmony of the spheres in an orderly progression of the planets. This influence of transcendental metaphysics fused many traditions, but it still kept this idea of antiquity as some kind of solid infrastructure in which to probe the mystical inner construction of the universe. Many of the modern ideas of education developed in the kindergarten system originated as this esoteric abstract goal of probing the inner mystical forces of the universe on the guise of antiquity. In the early kindergarten, the explicit, uh, the explicit objective was to get children to intuitively sense the music of the spheres, which what was considered to be underneath all growth of animal, vegetable, and mineral in nature. These little gifts were nothing less than intended to be a model of abstract metaphysical universal perfection and the key to sensing one's place in the natural continuum of the universe. He believed that learning, quote, the sacred language of geometry in youth would provide a common ground for all people and advance each individual and society in general into a realm of fundamental unity. In this particular concept, I want to point out quickly that this cosmic harmony is not the same thing as music as we usually think about it. It is a celestial harmony. It is not the Doobie Brothers listen to the music. You can't listen to this music because it's abstract and metaphysical. Although there are complications with crossing traditions of harmonics, this also gets uh, to the point that they were creating an organicist infrastructure in which to comparatively place themselves on a progressive trajectory of evolution. The revived interest in Neoplatonic speculative metaphysics among Froebel and his contemporaries who shared the cause of education towards nature was intertwined with the eclectic activity of nature philosophy and emergent doctrines of organicism in Germany and Switzerland. In, a, in music in the romantic musical work sense, this is also a period of great evolution towards consolidating what is now understood blanketly often as the scale. But it should be reminded that the construction of scales and harmonic tissues is a product of artistic invention and is by no means furnished by the natural formation or natural function of our ear. Although Froebel developed the concept of the sphere with peculiar intensity, it was also other philosophical naturalists in this intellectual social circle who searched for a deep line principle of natural order using this cosmic harmony. Direct influences on this pedagogy include Friedrich Schelling, Lawrence Aachen, and other crystallographers who variously explain the structure and directive forces of the universe in terms of it. This body of texts in German use esoteric metaphysical speculation with modes of imperial analysis from a way of different fields, and it might be termed a little bit sciency. The self-directive in these endeavors was the study of plant generation and organization through the parts of a plant as a successive permutation of a basic leaf form. Broader intellectual influences like Goethe, who overlapped with the growing influences of Romanticism, 
charted concepts of metamorphosis to all living beings and looked for correspondences in the detailed anatomical structure and strove to establish the basic types to which all the complex separate elements could be referred. Froebel's contribution to this discourse extended the search for the primal form. And this inquiry into the simple unities of pattern among all the variety of organisms, he took it to the child in the kindergarten, which literally means child cultivation or the garden of children, as it was understood then. The child was the germ or the seed. The child's body was becoming conceived as an organism in the true sense of the word, for it is a whole composed of parts which are reciprocally a means and ends, end quote. The child's mind was not an organism, however, for it is not composed of parts, neither is it separable into distinct faculties. The child organism in the kindergarten organism is a self-active energy having different phases of manifestation, but present wholly in each phase. And this gets back to the early 20th century geometric modernism critiques that I was thinking about earlier. The most iconic objects that emerged out of the kindergarten movement would probably be the kinder blocks that are referenced in Misfits. And this legacy carries on in the work of Adolf Herzl and his students like Oskar Schlemmer and Kandinsky, and later on at the Bauhaus with Itten's class. This fused with other mystical traditions because that was also a Neoplatonic infrastructure in their interrogations into the mystical inner construction of the universe. They're not exactly the same but this theory, this vague metaphysical theory, was exploited quite often. And it, and it always would center a particular perspective of abstraction. And in some ways, they do still work like the gifts when we think of universalist objectives with geometric abstraction. Froebel's interconnected series of 20 play gifts use sticks, coloring paper, mosaic tiles, sewing cards, as well as building blocks, drawing equipment, and the gridded tables which children would sometimes sit at. He conceived these by a careful study of children in nature, which was a large convention of theosophical mysticism. It was a spiritual science before spiritual science. You were the polymath, you are the antiquarian polymath. He believed that nature served to educate the germ through play. She, nature, puts in the child an irrepressible longing for play. The vital energy seems to be absorbed in play the unabsorbent mind considers play a childish weakness and strives to have the child to get over it as soon as possible. But here, play is put in opposition to work. In Froebel's conception of the kindergarten, play and the adult's play were not wildly different. In this play, it was an experimentalist technique that led towards knowledge. He believed that nature was to be followed. He believed that by playing the child, one might acquire habits of industry, perseverance, order, regularity, punctuality, and a knowledge of the qualities and uses of things. He devised 13 play things and called them, or 20, 20 eventually, and called them gifts to be used under the guidance of a skilled teacher, typically a woman kindergartner who was acting as the mother figure explicitly. He thought these would affect a culture of the child's mind in a happy, normal, rapid manner. There are the first gift of six balls, the sphere, cylinder, and cube, building blocks, tablets, slats, sticks, rings, thread, paint, shells, and seeds. There are also even occupations for perforating paper, sewing, embroidery, network drawing, painting, neat, plate, neat braiding, paper interlacing, paper folding, paper cutting, peas work, which is connects, cardboard work. And the last gift was modeling clay. You would model a freeform object. In this mystical context, which was still around 
in his followers and his many of the first two generations of Americans that imported this into the United States and were part of a colonial kindergarten project that took it elsewhere. The function of the adult or the mother in this kindergarten was to provide the conditions for implanting the symbolic germs of the abstract number or shape into vital actualized principles into the mind of the unconscious child. To put this more simply, or to put this in a way that might be tangible in a non-metaphysical way, it's taking something that is abstract, meant to probe the universe, that was never meant to be sounded as music or image or shape. And it's realizing it and inscribing it into the body of the child. Quote, and so in respect to other domains of that child action, which I and we shall call play, I see that I can make these domains also my own. I can convert children's activities energies, amusements, occupations, and all that goes by the name of play into instruments for my purpose and therefore transform play into work. This work will be education in the true sense of the term. The conception of it as I have gained from the children themselves, they have taught me how to teach them. To educate in this milieu was to, de to develop a faculty by arousing a concept called self-play or self-activity. The toys were meant to be sensed before you could think about the metaphysical cosmos of the universe. They were for children. They were for very, very young children. You would touch the abstract concept before and materialize it and inscribe it into your body before you would even learn to think about what you were doing. It was an impulse from not a mere external compulsion and it was not meant to be needful. A child to Froebel was not a useful child if the child did not want to play. It was not a good child. You couldn't work with that child because all children are inherently good because they are vital and they are connected to the music of the spheres. This vital energy that connects the terrestrial realm to the astral realm. It is the spherical music, the divine music that connects all matter in the universe on one realm and the next. Children were put in a particularly careful place in this hierarchy of the chain because they were closer to nature in their infancy. That was preserved in this schema and they were understood to be able to tap into their vital natural abilities to play. And that was cultivated in the garden like an organism. The adults in this scheme for them, the wisdom was to provide the conditions for implanting symbolic germs of vital principles into the minds of unconscious children. The unfolding of the germs into controlling principles should be the work of later years, i.e. adding and subtracting and making mud pies. The habit of pointing morals of tales or incidents was not a practice in this pedagogy, at least in the first 25 years you would need to unfold and experience it for yourself. You would need to be trusted to universalize and feel the true inner mystical geometry of nature. Everything in essence was a quote, alchemy of the transmutation of this harmonic symbol into the reality symbolized. And here are some papers here. The reason I wanted to point out that there was a different kind of harmony besides social harmony is that this played an important role in theories of evolution at the time. The idea that man was co-evolving together in an astral realm, in the world that ever in a cosmology where everything is connected through the music of the spheres, self-improvement became an impetus for not just your own improvement, but you would pull up the entire, quote, race as a process. And this was always a process of becoming. 
It was never a finitude because the harmony of the spheres is infinitesimal and infinite. There is no boundary because it is abstract metaphysics in this particular context, which is a very syncretic and mystical understanding of it. It has impelled science to the conclusion in this context that the laws of nature, as well as objects of nature, had arisen through processes of evolution and had inspired corresponding psychologic doctrines that both the ideas and the so-called faculties of mind are the products of individual human mind's own self-activity. These new concepts emerging with organicism shed fresh light upon spiritual unity of mankind and made it impossible for any new kind of Rousseau to conceive of atomic individuals with this kind of necessitating counterbalance. It conceived to us that the original state of man was not an ideal state, that it was the golden age was yet to come. This theory showed that in truth, human nature existed as a self-created activity and that it is realized in the individual only through participation, which would need to be like play in order to see results. This is, of course, incredibly Eurocentric and the white supremacist logic of this harmony of this process plays out on many different levels. It is very complicated because sometimes these values are very progressive. Sometimes these values can be very democratic. They can be very feminist. And I think that to return to this work in Misfits, which is the, the photograph of the child, I was first only thinking of the objects in the exhibition that were screaming like platonic solids, because I knew that there was something here that I could probe if I peeled back what was going on in Preble's intellectual context a bit further. But as I got into this and I started to become more familiar with concepts of self-assisted play and processes of becoming an organicism, this photograph of the child in jumbled alphabet became very striking. By not playing, this child is a bad child in one cosmology, but that's just one cosmology. By not playing, this child is also not being exploited. And I think that that balance often comes out in the humor of Neri Bagrabian's work, but also in some of the contingent complexities why would this photograph be here when there's all of these children in Marion Goodman Gallery lapping around and laying on the floor? It gives even more specific and poignant sight responsive affect when I look at it this way. And it also helps me to think through the universalisms that happen in histories and tellings of geometric modernisms and universalisms that seem like geometry is a universal language. It is not. Neither is harmony, neither is the harmony of the spheres. Um, thank you. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you very much. Um, I want to see if we have um, just a little bit of time for a couple of questions. And I'm just, um, please, if you have questions, uh, put them into the chat. And um, I've got a couple, got a couple of questions for Jana, and I'm sure there'll also be some coming for, for Frederick, as uh, the second speaker always uh, has a slight delay with the questions. Um, so Jana, um, here, is, um, here is a question. Um, in comparison to Mata Clark, uh, Bagramian utilizes the white box of the gallery. Do you see her work saying anything about uh, gender or the body within the art world specifically? Um, Bagramian's work? I mean, I think, you know, I was really struck by the sort of finesse and um, beauty of the of the images that circulate of Bagramian's work, which Ingie talked about so um, beautifully on Monday. 
Um, and so, and I, so I think that what, she, like, when I think about this work and it's kind of, I mean, she's done the outdoor pieces like on Tract and um, the other ones, but I think there's a really kind of muscular way that she's embracing the white cube um, that is, uh, I'm not, I mean, I think it's, you know, I, I think I'd have to think more about how to ascribe gender to that, but I think um, there's, there's a, yeah, I think like claiming, claiming the sort of like almost um, sterileness of those spaces as like this kind of playground as we've been hearing in the talks is, um, is a gesture that kind of, I would say subverts stereotypes around, you know, the feminization of interiors or the white cube as this kind of like male coded, male dominated space. So I think there's some productive, um, there's a productively challenging embrace of the white cube, I feel like in her work. That's what I would say to that question. Thank you. And Frederick, um, I have a question from uh, one of our other speakers, um, India, um, saying uh, she is fascinated by what you say about the unnaturalness, excuse me, the unnaturalness of scale and harmonies. Do we have an innate fear of non-harmony? Would you say that chaos is on the other side or is it something else? I would say that I can't speak for anyone but myself. And if you teach it to undergrads, you're not afraid of it. So <laughs> any kind of harmony, uh, maybe, well, TBD. I don't know every kind of harmony, um, but it is important, I think, um, to shout it out if you didn't know that the, that the scale was not so it has to be tempered all pianos are tempered it's well tempered clavier and it's pretty much like a side leap it's close but it doesn't work exactly so what do you do when you get that mathematical infrastructure and it almost works but it doesn't exactly work and it's that little thing that you throw out that becomes the problem to the cosmology and i think that a lot of people have that fear, the fear that it's called the fifth hammer, that the math doesn't quite work out because it's speculative, it's a speculation. So on a larger scale, I think there's a huge fear, but I think it's maybe not related to harmony, it's related to having your world rocked. So <laughs> your mathematical okay. world rocked. Yeah, or or at, at bottom, and that may have been um, what, what she was, um, thinking of also um, a discomfort with, with chaos or a lack of control or perceived mm. lack of order. I mean, chaos is just another form of order, right? That's what Morris <laughs> said. Another, another, I don't want to bore everybody to death, but another route that the speculative harmonic, the, the occult speculative harmonics took in the early 20th century was expressionism, was expressionist mm -hmm. dance. It was Ausdruck's taunts. And they were doing it for trance reasons, states of extreme, Hugo Ball was, was basically an alchemist, revivalist. So it, you know, it, 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 it can get exploited for many different reasons. And I think that um, what you were talking about the other day in terms of our relationship to feeling like we're out of balance is something that's grounded more to the site in certain cases, because this harmony, this specific kind of strand of, of harmony was exploited for all different reasons in a 60 mile radius. Yeah, I, I think there's obviously so much to explore here. Um, and I'm just being mindful of the time. Um, I also, want to, uh, I know we're going to be convening tomorrow, and I think some of the um, other questions that we have are maybe more productively opened up um, in the course of a larger uh, discussion. So I think today we will wrap things up. I thank both of you very much. Um, 
and I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today. I hope you can join us tomorrow. As I said at the top of the hour, it's under the same link, uh, but it's we're one hour later, so 1 p.m. Central Time. Um, we will start with a roundtable discussion uh, led by myself with all of our speakers, and that will be followed by uh, Professor Miwan Kwan and her keynote address. And I think again to uh, our speakers and to all of you for joining and i'll see you tomorrow thanks bye bye